If you're an investor and you have money in the markets, you're probably wondering how the upcoming November election will impact your portfolio, and you probably want to know where the next great buying opportunities are. Well, joining me to help break that down for you is Rodney Johnson. He's a former Wall Street bond trader. He's been writing on the economy and financial markets for over 20 years. He's the editor of InformedAmerican.com and contributor to WallStreetWireNews.com. Rodney. First of all, thanks for coming on. And uh, if you could also, uh, while you say hello to everybody, maybe set uh, the landscape of where we're headed in the financial markets uh, as we head into this election and then potentially the, the inauguration of either one of these two men. Oh, morning, Dave. Uh, yeah, we're, we're looking at this election and people are, are talking about it as a toggle and that's not really the way to look at it. Uh, the policies of the two different parties obviously are very different. You have President Trump uh, looking at, of course, lower taxes, low taxes, uh, the rebates on corporate taxes from 2017, uh, lowering regulations, wanting businesses to do more, not pursuing uh, green energy and other things like that. And then, of course, you have uh, the Biden, potential Biden administration uh, claiming very, you know, loudly, we're going to raise some taxes, people. <laughs> we're going to put corporate taxes halfway back. We're going to recapture uh, some more of the foreign tax and we're going to raise taxes on people who make more, mm -hmm. and we're going to focus on renewable energy, we're going to focus on some shows of changes, we're going to make what they call investments, but let's face it, it's payments, uh, into these different areas that requires more money. And so that does affect us personally. Uh, if you're paying more taxes, you don't have as much money in your pocket, and you can't invest as much. Uh, and it does affect perhaps what we're going to invest in, but business moves. And so that's kind of the key takeaway here is we move to the businesses or rather the investment uh, landscape changes to reflect the businesses that are in favor. And so that's what we need to be looking at as we're evaluating what this might be in what will be the months and couple of years to come. Great. Yeah. And uh, so regardless of the policies, there are going to be opportunities somewhere. Yeah. And uh, as we looked at this, Ronnie, before we started, we're, we're, we, we tried to just sort of distill things down a little bit. Uh, instead of looking at uh, every single sector, say, in the S&P, we've kind of narrowed it down to the ones that we think are most at play. Right, Ronnie? We've got about exactly. we, we, yeah, we've got five here. So let's get started. Let's start with the tech sector, Rodney. This uh, tech has had a big run for most of the year uh, after the recovery in March and uh, maybe just teetering a little bit as we're heading in, into the election, but it had a huge run and uh, pushing up the markets broadly. Uh, so so what's, the, what's the outlook for tech under a Biden or a Trump administration? Well, I think uh, if you if you look at the general landscape of tech and what's happened, the, the pandemic and the lockdown has helped it dramatically uh, because we are using more of it. or We're using it at home. We're supplanting what we used to do, going out and shopping, meeting with people with technology like Zoom, like you know we're using now. We're on and, it right uh, now. <laughs> exactly, shopping online, all sorts of things. Yeah. And we, you know, we kind of, with a wink and a nod, we include consumer wearables and other things like that underneath tech. You know, you look at Apple, is that a tech company? Uh, you know, they make, they make, you know, music players and stuff and phones, mm -hmm. but we call it tech. And so they've done quite well. I don't think that's going away. Uh, that incredible run, I think, becomes uh, more, uh, uh, more implanted in the economy, firmer in the economy, which it was anyway. And it kind of supercharges the replacement um, pace at which we're going to do things. People who might not have replaced, I don't know, a phone or a laptop or whatever, they're going to do it because they want it now because they're using it so much. Now, a lot of that happened over the summer, but that is going to take a long time uh, to make its way through the entire economy. And so we're going to have that replacement cycle continuing now. And I think that's very good for tech. When you look at the two different uh, potential administrations, a continuation of the Trump administration doesn't change anything. So that's kind of, you know, business as, as usual. On the Biden side, you might see people uh, harvesting some gains to be in front of a change in taxes. And so they might take capital gains now, which would, of course, be a lot in tech. So mm -hmm. they would sell their shares and then reestablish a position in the new year so that they could put their capital gains in 2020 and pay the rate that they know what it is, right? And uh, potentially Biden is going to raise the capital gains rate, particularly for people who earn more money. And so they would want to make that this year. So you might see techs sell off uh, if Biden is elected, but I think it's only from a tax standpoint, and then you would get it to come back in the new year. Uh, what about a, if Trump is reelected, Rodney? There's been some some grumblings about maybe going after big tech with some more regulation or opening them up to uh, taking away some of their immunity to lawsuits. Could there that be an effect? Uh, I'm thinking, you know, social media, Twitter, Facebook, potentially Google. Any, any threat there? Well, I, there's a threat because do you 
do you reduce their business? And so that, that's the question, right? The big problem with Facebook over the last year was the Europeans saying, hey, you have to do all these things to, preserve, uh, to protect privacy. And it basically ruined their digital advertising model in the European Union. And so that's a harm to the company. Mm -hmm. That's not the same as saying break up the company. If you're saying, hey, you can no longer control these six things, you now have to be six companies. Well, guess what? You just increase the number of investment opportunities by five. And so not a, not a factor of five, but you went from one investment to, five, to six of potential investments. And so that doesn't necessarily hurt the business. In the short term, it does because nobody knows what it's going to look like. You know, uh, an Apple run by uh, Tim Cook is doing quite well. If, if, and this is, I'm not saying this is going to happen, but as an example, if you had to break it into a phone company and an Apple Watch wearable company okay. and, you know, something else, an app store, then would those other two companies be run as well as Tim Cook has done? I don't know. And so that change would cause some uncertainty that people might wonder about, but it doesn't change the fact that we as consumers want those businesses and will continue to drive them. Yeah, great points. All right, Roddy, let's shift to energy. This is something that you always have your eye on, something you've been writing about for a lot. It's a space you follow very closely. Uh, over, the, over the last couple of years, the U.S. has become the largest producer of crude oil. Uh, of course, we've, we've got natural gas, crude, we've been explosion of fracking and all that. But the energy sector has suffered a lot this year, particularly with the, with the coronavirus pandemic, uh, a lack of demand, and a lot of these companies are saddled with debt. Uh, talk about the energy sector under, under, under a Biden or Trump administration. So we've been uh, writing about the uh, energy sector forever, right? Because it's been around for, you know, decades. And so it's, it's always a, a constant uh, concern. And so fracking uh, came with a lot of opportunity. But as you noted, many of the fracking companies grew by taking on debt. They never really produced the profits. And so as we got into the pandemic and the lockdown, coronavirus did something that governments couldn't. They changed our consumption of energy, which tends to be very inelastic. We drive the same distance to work every day. We like to go on vacation. As prices get high, maybe we see a higher demand for smaller cars. As prices yeah. fall, we see a, a demand go up for big SUVs. But we still drive a bunch of miles. Coronavirus changed that. We do not drive the miles. And so the demand drop in a way that in some that in some ways will be permanent and that a lot of people who are telecommuting won't go back or certainly won't go back full time. And so it's that softening of demand that the energy producing world is looking at and going, hey, wait a second, we got to deal with this. And we're not the wild card anymore. The wild card, of course, is the Middle East, because in the United States, the energy companies are not nationalized. They don't add money to the national budget, whereas in many oil producing countries, that is their main export. And so it's what they use to balance their national budget. And so they have a real stake in prices being higher and they manipulate them to make that so. And so we kind of exist at the end of this string that the Middle East is flipping around. We can change it some by producing more or less, but still, they're the ones that have this big need. The, the other big uh, change, of course, is um, green cars or battery powered vehicles, which I have always said, look, we're not there yet because they couldn't go the distance as it is, right? They, they, they needed to recharge after a couple hundred miles. The recharge took a long time, 30 minutes if you had a supercharger just to get 80%, and then you had to stop again. Well, there's new battery technology out there. QuantumScape uh, has a solid state lithium battery uh, that can go uh, a much greater distance. I believe the increase per density is around 75, 80%. So you can think of it as, you know, a car that could go 300 is now going to go 500 plus miles on a single charge and it can recharge 80% in 15 minutes. That's a big deal. That, that can change the landscape. Now they're not going to have them in cars till 2024, but Volkswagen has already pledged tens of billions. I think it's $70 billion toward this uh, General Motors, not toward that company in particular, although they are in a JV with them. Uh, General Motors has pledged, I believe, 20 billion. A lot of car companies are going this way. And so that is going to change the landscape of energy. Uh, when you look at the two administrations, Trump clearly is, I, I, don't, I don't say favoring fossil fuels. He's more about letting the market take its course. And so he has, of course, opened up Anwar and some other places for some drilling, but he can't change the demand structure of the nation and the world. And that's the real thing here. Mm -hmm. And so um, he's not going to change that direction. He's going to let it play. And so the fossil fuel companies have a longer lease on life 
uh, and what they're doing with their current activities under a Trump administration. Whereas under Biden, he's clearly said that he supports the Green New Deal uh, before. He certainly wants to move toward a zero emission net, zero emission, zero emission nation over the next 20 years. And so there is going to be a big push toward battery powered vehicles, all sorts of things that will not favor fossil fuel, but fossil fuel is not going anywhere for the next administration. It's just not because yeah. we're not going to change that quickly. I believe it's 2% of our cars are, are electric at this point. We are not going to 10% over the next four years and right. certainly not getting close to 20 or 30. Uh, so is it potential, though, is it fair to say that under a Trump administration uh, re-election that the, that the energy markets could be potentially more stable, whereas uh, if a Biden administration comes in with, say, a Green New Deal, uh, that might sh certainly shake things up a little bit faster than, the, than it normally would occur? Right. And so in it, from an investing standpoint, what you're looking at is you can think about TRIA, the, uh, the, old, uh, the U.S. side of the old Philip Morris uh, cigarette company. Now, they, of course, are under a ban for advertising and all sorts of other things. But what they became is a cash company. They're a cash cow. They throw off dividends. And so old line energy companies are having to write down their reserves because they're like, well, if our reserves were supposed to be pulled out of the ground over the next 150 years, and we think fossil fuel in general is going to dwindle over the next 60, then they don't have as much value. And so what you would see is a company that writes down a lot of its balance sheet, but is still selling a lot of stuff today. And so if you don't think the company has a long future, what you're trying to do is squeeze all the money out of it you can in the short <laughs> term. And that plays toward dividend investors because you know that that company is not making huge investments for the future because it's just not there. Mm. And so uh, the difference would be at what speed that takes place. And again, I live near Houston, Texas. This is the petrochemical capital of the United States. And so I don't have any qualms about being here because I don't think this is changing in the next decade, even two. And so uh, there's a lot of money to be made, a lot of cash to be uh, had in the system, but it is a difference of focus and the amount of investment that's going to go back in depending on the next administration. Excellent. Great stuff, Rodney. Rodney, let's shift to uh, industrials and materials. We've heard rumors of an uh, infrastructure bill <laughs> for I don't know how long now. Five years, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Of course, to fix some of the long running problems in US infrastructure and to modernize it as well. Uh, but of course, nothing's gotten passed. Uh, but Rodney, could this, could this next term finally be the term where we see a major infrastructure bill get passed? And uh, how does that look for either candidate? I, that is one of the biggest things I think is coming no matter which candidate gets into office because they both want it. it. It does a lot of things. It puts more Americans back to work. It brings uh, more jobs to the United States. It uses more internal resources because, of course, it's going to come with all sorts of limitations on it. You can only use U.S. sourced stuff, blah, 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 blah. And it's big and it has a tangible outcome. When you send money to consumers uh, who are out of work or you just send it to every American, Clearly, you've given people money and you can see the return in terms of the increased or consistent uh, consumer activity. But when you say we're going to build or rebuild, redo whatever, refurbish uh, 5,000 miles of highway and 400 bridges, those are pictures. Yeah. And pictures mean a lot. It's really important to have that physical thing where you can say, you know, I did that. And so I, I think no matter who gets into office, we're going to see an infrastructure bill of some sort because it, it checks all the boxes. And the one thing holding it back, remember the big meeting that Trump had with Schumer and Pelosi where they agreed to do this for $1.1 or $1.2 trillion back in, I think, 2017, early 2017. Mm -hmm. The holdup was how are, you going to, how are you going to fund it? How are you going to pay for all this? And now nobody cares about that no. side of the equation. And so when you take that away, I mean, the candy store is yours, right? If you never have to go by the register, you just get to eat the candy. Well, that's what we're going to do. <laughs> and so I think that's coming. Yeah. And uh, the Trump, I believe his proposal is still around that uh, just around a trillion. Biden's is even, is even uh, potentially double that. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so you think this, so Ronnie, final word on this topic, you think this is coming and this could be an opportunity. Whether you, whether you agree with all the spending or not, this could be a chance for, uh, for investors to, to take advantage of that. Absolutely. And you're looking for infrastructure companies in the United States. You're looking for the, uh, the commercial builders. You're looking for the providers of the cement and the asphalt and the trucks and the large machines. I mean, it is Caterpillar, right? Uh, this one, in terms of indices, this one favors the Dow more than it favors the S&P or the NASDAQ. And so I, I think there's something to that over the next couple of years, for sure, no matter who gets into office. 
Great. Let's look at healthcare, Rodney. There's been a rush for a vaccine. We've seen the, a lot of therapeutics come out. Uh, in terms of policy, uh, Trump wants to get rid of Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act. Uh, on the other hand, President or potential President Biden wants to strengthen Obamacare, expand Medicaid, expand Medicare. Um, but uh, one place where they both agree is to lower drug prices and to push for more generics. So uh, what do you see happening in the healthcare sector, uh, depending on who gets elected? Healthcare is a sticky wicket, right? It is just hard to figure out where the money is going to be made um, and, and if there is any money to be made. Um, I am very cautious about the large pharmaceutical companies and um, the large insurance companies. Uh, if President Trump remains in office, I think that uh, United Health and some others are going to benefit because the status quo stays around and they're not potentially crowded out by a single payer or a government option that becomes the dominant force, Medicare for all kind of. But on the pharmaceutical side, um, you, you mentioned, you know, the COVID of the race for a vaccine. Well, it's all been a race for a vaccine with a very nominal price. Mm. And so if somebody ends up with a vaccine or ends up with a very, very useful therapeutic, they're going to be under a lot of pressure to make that available for a nickel uh, so that people can get it. Uh, and the push to lower drug prices means pharmaceutical companies don't make as much money. Yeah. And so I've warned for years that people should be very conservative on the pharmaceutical side because the government can legislate out the profit. Um, I think, though, that we're looking at a very interesting situation because of COVID-19 and all the money poured into this vaccination research. We're going to see a lot of new drugs come out of this for many other uses. And so I think the next two to you know, 10 years are going to be marked by a lot of transformational drugs from bio companies, biopharmaceuticals, bio research companies. That's not necessarily going to depend on either um, candidate or either administration, although we definitely have to give credit to uh, the Trump administration for fast tracking a lot of things. Now, I don't, I don't want to see anything out there that's not tested, not safe. Uh, but I mean, right to try and some other things that he's brought through the FDA, I believe have streamlined the process and will allow drugs to get to market faster in the United States, which has been a hurdle for a very long time. And so that's something that I think is not going to go backwards. Interesting. Uh, but uh, you don't see major uh, either one of these guys. I mean, wh where would be the pain point for either one of them? Well, the pain point, uh, if Biden is elected, I believe is in the large healthcare insurance companies like a United. Uh, that I think is going to take a hit. I think pharmaceutical companies under either one uh, are going to be under pressure, but I think biotech is going to be the place to go. So you want to look down to those research companies that perhaps come up with the next great new molecule. Excellent. Right. And last but not least, let's talk about precious metals. We get, always get a lot of questions okay. about gold. Uh, it's a very, uh, it could be a controversial topic. Uh, now I, I'm thinking, you know, precious, this is precious metals broadly, but uh, specifically gold here, probably the one, uh, probably the one people have most on their eye. Uh, now we've got Fed policy going on, Rodney, which is going to allow inflation to, to rise, which sort of sets the, the backdrop of what's going on. Uh, what's, what's the precious metals outlook for, for either a Biden or a Trump presidency? Well, I, you know, the presidency has something to do with precious metals, but it's really more about the central bank. And so if we, if we look at the administrations, um, Trump being a continuation of where he's been, um, he wants the dollar to be weaker because he wants our exports to be cheaper to the rest of the world. And he said that before. And a weaker dollar helps gold. Uh, and so that's just kind of that toggle or inverse relationship. Um, and so I think gold would actually do a little better um, under him. Uh, uh, gold would, the price of gold would go up a little under him. Let's go there, not better, because uh, that implies comparing to Biden. I think Biden could be the wild card because the amount of spending that he wants to do, and, and clearly we, have, we haven't broken the bank. We haven't even considered the bank over <laughs> the last you know, 10 months. Yeah. Uh, and what we're doing in our deficits. But I think that would, would be exponential under a Biden administration, potentially. And if that level of spending continues or grows, that uncertainty is part of what drives gold. People are, are, are fearful of what's going to happen with their currency. They're fearful of what's going to happen to the value of their savings. And so they look to something that perhaps can uh, protect them. And it, gold is one of them. And so I think that uncertainty under a Biden presidency until people figure it out would actually push gold up. The central bank is pushing on inflation. The other thing that tends to help gold, although not great, unless you see a lot of inflation, 
And that the, the central bank, the Federal Reserve, um, has told us now that they've changed policy. Their policy used to be as inflation reaches their target of about 2%, uh, then they start to raise interest rates because they don't want the economy to heat up beyond that and cause inflation to go higher, blah, blah, blah. And they said recently, okay, we're changing this stance. Instead, we're going to let inflation run past 2% for some period of time. So the average inflation is 2%. What they didn't define is how long these periods are. Are you only looking back for a year when once inflation reaches 2% or are you looking back 10 years? And so that determines how long they'll let inflation run hotter than 2% in the future. Now they were quick to say, we're not gonna let it get out of control, but they didn't tell us what that was either. If we see inflation creep back to or above 2%, we're gonna see gold go higher because people are gonna be rightly uh, concerned about the value of where things are going and their purchasing power, and they're going to wonder what the Fed is going to do. Now, if the Fed comes in and provides concrete guidance, that could change it. Then, then we would take inflation off the table as one of the things driving gold. Mm -hmm. Then it becomes just the uncertainty on the policy side. And yeah. so, but right now, you have the potential for uncertainty, both from a Biden presidency and from the inflation fighting efforts of the Fed, which could drive precious metals higher. Ronnie, what about a quickly? What about a scenario? Uh, but before the inauguration in January, what about a contested election? Uh, what if something drags on for weeks or months? Could this be an opportunity for uh, people to get in on gold, even just temporarily? Well, I think it'll be an opportunity, but not from the standpoint people think, um, because uh, part of our larger research on the economic side said that we do have some retrenchment to go through. And it should be happening over the next couple of years. And so if you look at the equity markets today, they're above where they were at the beginning of the year. And you're going to be hard pressed to say that we're doing better than we were in January. And so why are the markets higher? Now, clearly, the markets are not the economy. The markets only measure, you know, certain things, certain companies, and the tech companies have done quite well, and they're leading the way. Um, but what we have is a lot of debt, not only with the government, but personally, people have debt and around the world, companies have debt. And so the, the, we have to go through kind of this retrenchment on that corporate side, which should pull down companies at some point. And so we should get a retrenchment in the equity markets before we move higher again. And I believe the uncertainty around a contested election would be part of that process hmm. where people say, frankly, I just don't know. And I'm a lot better recognizing my gains, not just from 2020, but I mean, 2019, the market was up 30%. And certainly since the bull market started, the last one, uh, in 2010, this has been a great decade. Step aside, take your gains, put the money in the bank, and wait. When you get into that sort of environment, that fear environment where you don't know what's going to happen and um, everybody's kind of scrambling, I say put your money in the bank. That's not what people, well, that's maybe what you and I do, but large investors don't. When I mean, say large investors, I mean people with hundreds of millions or billions of dollars, institutions, pension funds, whatever. What they do is they buy U.S. Treasuries. And so they drive down the yields on U.S. Treasury bonds because it's nothing more than a parking space. Mm. They'll take the money, put it in U.S. Treasuries, and just wait for a different day. When that happens, the value of the dollar goes up because that sort of parking money happens around the world. People from all over choose the U.S. dollar. And to invest in U.S. Treasuries, you first have to change your currency into U.S. dollars. So that makes the dollar go up and it makes yields come down. And so that would be an opportunity to buy gold because a stronger dollar is going to hurt gold. And so if we get into this uncertainty over the election and we see the dollar start to spike and yields falling and the markets are dropping, you should see gold go down. And that would be an opportunity for people to step in before whatever's going to come next. Interesting. Thanks for breaking that down, Rodney. Rodney, before I let you get out of here, I'd like if you could to just give everybody sort of a, we broke down those five sectors. What about just sort of a 30,000 foot view of the markets as a whole for maybe some uh, more passive investors? Well, I, again, I, I do think we're into some chop right here. And I think potentially we have a significant leg down uh, coming in the overall markets as people try to protect gains that they've had. Um, if we get into a contested election, as we just talked about, or we get a Biden presidency and people say, hey, I want to take some chips off the table. It doesn't mean they don't believe in what's coming in the United States. It means they want to protect those gains and pay a lower tax rate before reestablishing positions in the new year. And so um, I think that, that if people are long-term 
uh, they should choose where they want to be and understand that it could be a bit painful for several months or a little more as we kind of get through this very uncertain and unstable and unsettled environment. But remember, nobody serves by the markets going down. That, that's a general premise. And so what you have are all sorts of people working to keep the markets higher. And the best example is, is uh, the indexes, uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average. People talk about that as if it's a thing. Well, it is a thing, but it's a changing thing. Dow Jones, the company, maintains that average, and they pull companies out and put new companies yeah. in. And so when people say, well, the market's done, blah, 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 remember, you're not looking at the same companies. Now, they don't do it every year, but they do it. And so the same with the S&P, they switch out companies. And so everybody wants the market to go higher because it makes people feel good. It makes their 401ks higher, blah, blah, blah. So you have the Federal Reserve working on this. You have the administration working on this. You have U.S. Treasury working on this. And so the markets do go down. And, and like I said, I believe there's a lot of, of risk right now. But I believe over the long term, if that's what people are doing, that they're frankly walk, looking at that market walking back up. Great. Well, that is how the upcoming election, no matter who wins, could impact your portfolio. And we've talked about and broke down where those buying opportunities are. We appreciate you coming on to do that, Rodney. Uh, thank you all for watching. I want you all to stay up to date on all the latest financial news. Go to wallstreetwirenews.com to get today's market in minutes. For Rodney Johnson, I'm Dave Oakenquist, and have a great trading day.